Physiology. Let's begin together our physiology voice shots together regarding the physiology. For most of the surgeons, it might be irritating at first. But in MRCS exam, we have a scope and number of questions for each chapter. So it will be your key in the exam. We have almost 45 pure physiology questions registered in the MRCS exam. But we will have at least from 3 to 5 ABG questions and from 3 to 5 easy questions as we'll add 3 to 5 pulmonary function questions. And you have the Glasgow Coma Scale, the electrolyte imbalance. All of this are physiology. So you are almost having with you a pure 30 question granted in the exam. Isn't it making a relief for a surgeon? So let's have this physiology crack together. Regarding the acid-base balance, the pulmonary embolism is frequently asked in the exam, and it's a combination of hypoxia and respiratory alkalosis. So should just suggest a pulmonary embolism. The respiratory alkalosis is due to hyperventilation associated with the pulmonary embolism. Urethrosigmoidostomy, this is a metabolic acidosis and to compensate the patient will attempt to reduce the pH level in the blood by hyperventilation. So this will cause a low carbon dioxide level. Peptic ulcer causing pyloric stenosis. This is a tricky question. This will cause the patient to be alkalotic because he will be losing the gastric juice which is acidic. That's why this patient will be alkalotic, metabolic alkalosis because he has lost a metabolic acid fluid. That's why he will be a metabolic alkalosis during vomiting due to pyloric stenosis. Take care. Dear great surgeons, take care. A very famous question regarding old men, always old men, talking about old men who has gone into intensive care unit during an emergency abdominal aortic aneurysm repair or even a trauma. Then he will tell you he develops abdominal pain and diarrhea and is profoundly unwell. This is a significant of abdominal aortic aneurysm repair because he most probably will be treated with EVAR and develop the abdominal pain and diarrhea. Abdominal pain and diarrhea will suggest a mesenteric infarction by the way, so you have to keep it in mind. This patient will be, regarding the physiology, will be a metabolic acidosis. So, if the patient became with abdominal pain, and distension with constipation, this is intestinal obstruction. But if we have abdominal pain and diarrhea, think of mesenteric infarction or mesenteric ischemia or mesenteric vascular occlusion. We having ischemia there and the intestine can't withstand the stool anymore and it will be diarrhea like. Dear great surgeon, take care. We have three items in your acid base equation will make your life easy. In the ABG, look at those three at first. The pH and the carbon dioxide and the bicarb. The pH is giving you the clue if it's alkalosis or acidosis. If it's below 7.35, we are talking about an acid media. If we are talking above 7.45, we are talking about alkali media. So it's alkalosis if it's above 7.45. And if it's below 7.35, this is acidosis. So if it's high, it's alkalosis. And if it's low, it's acidosis. Now, let's take care of the CO2. CO2 is the clue of the buffering system action taken by the respiratory system while the bicarb is the clue of the buffering system take place by the whole body especially the renal system 
we have main three uh, we have two main buffering systems the respiratory and the renal those are the two main so regarding the carbon dioxide if we are retaining carbon dioxide we are retaining acid and if we are retaining bicarb we are retaining alkali do the equation and keep it in mind draw three arrows arrow beside the pH arrow beside the carbon dioxide arrow beside the bicarb and if you know this simple trick you can solve most of the pH acid base balance equations if you found all the arrows merely together so we are talking about metabolic while the respiratory you will find the arrows reverse it against each other and of course you will know is it alkalosis or acidosis from the pH so define the pH is it acidosis or alkalosis draw your arrows if you found the arrows beside the pH carbon dioxide and bicarb are reversed we are talking about respiratory and if you found the arrows are together merely together more or less you will find this a metabolic cause hope this make it simple trick in the exam try it now let's have some glimpse of the electrolytes and minerals regarding the calcium calcium ions are linked to wide range of physiological process it's important the largest store of bodily calcium is contained within the skeleton and the calcium level are primarily controlled by parathyroid hormone vitamin d and calcitonin again the three not only the birth hormone but the vitamin d and calcitonin as well let's finish the calcitonin because it's secreted by c cell of thyroid inhibits intestinal calcium absorption and inhibit osteoclast activity as well as it inhibit the renal tubular, tubular absorption of the calcium we all know that most of the filter calcium is reabsorbed around 95 percent <laughs> Are reabsorbed and the rare disorder of familial hypocalcemic calciuria may affect this proportion by the way regarding the parathormone hormone it increases the calcium level and decreases the phosphate level it increases the bone resorption again it increases the bone resorption but the calcitonin inhibits renal tubular absorption of the calcium why the birth hormone increase bone resorption take care from the terms use them as it is because it symbols some meaning the immediate action of the birth hormone on osteoplast is to increase the calcium in the extracellular fluid and osteoplast produce a protein signaling molecule that activate osteoclast which cause bone resorption increase renal tubular reabsorption of the calcium this is a part of hormone and increase the synthesis of the vitamin d in the kidney which increases the bowel absorption of the calcium and decrease the renal phosphate reabsorption but what is the function of vitamin d vitamin d role in calcium it increases the plasma calcium and the plasma phosphate remember the birth hormone increases the calcium but decreases the phosphate level but the vitamin d increases the plasma calcium and the plasma phosphate vitamin d increases the renal tubular reabsorption remember the birth hormone increases the bone resorption increases the renal tubular reabsorption just like vitamin d increases the renal tubular reabsorption and the gut absorption of calcium it's of course a logic because the birth hormone increases the synthesis of the activated dihydrocarcifil oral which is the vitamin d so it increases the osteoclastic activity at high level and osteoplasts at low level and increase the renal phosphate reabsorption by the way it's very important vitamin d to be taken with co with caution because it can cause vitamin toxicity very common with vitamin d low vitamin d is not uh, beloved and high vitamin d 
is not beloved to be just precise the limited dose the needed dose is optimal in stress it's a miracle from god to have hyperglycemia rather than hypoglycemia to help you with your fight or even your flight that's why the stress response of the body will be including hyperglycemia keep this in mind and the hyperglycemia is by the cortisol level the stress response by the endocrine and the metabolic changes is frequently asked in the exam and have to be in your mind uh, any stress any stress can cause this stress response surgery is a stress being in labor is a stress even studying surgery is stressful so this will cause you a metabolic surgical stress changes so take care of yourself so the stress response will be precipitating hormonal and metabolic changes causing the stress response and the stress response is associated with substrate mobilization like muscle protein loss or sodium and water retention and suppression of anabolic hormone secretion as well as activation of the sympathetic nervous system and of course your immunological and hematological changes will occur the hypothalamic and pituitary axis the hypothalamic pituitary axis and the sympathetic nervous system are activated and there is a failure of the normal feedback mechanism during the stress response so take care so what hormonal change will occur during the stress response remember you during your study you need to be growing in your ideas this is will cause increase in the growth hormone you will need to be hyperglycemic this will increase by the cortisol and of course you need a buffering system that's why the renal system will be acting with the renin increasing and the adenocorticotropic hormone will increase some aldosterone and the prolactin and the antidiuretic hormone and the glucagon will occur some will ask me why the prolactin will be increased during the stress response to give you milk haha <laughs> it's a joke by the way so the hormones will increase during your stress will be the growth hormone cortisol renin adenocorticotropic hormone as well as aldosterone and prolactin and the antidiuretic hormone and the glucagon but what hormones will decrease during your stress the insulin testosterone and the estrogen during your stress you are not thinking about getting pregnancy or uh, ovulating somebody and uh, so there is no need for the testosterone or the estrogen to prove your humanhood even like a man you will need to be fighting or flighting so during your fight you will need other hormones other than the insulin or the testosterone or the estrogen nobody fight with testosterone or insulin you can fight with your growth hormone and cortisol renin aldosterone prolactin antidiuretic hormone to antidiuretic is important nobody want to be during his flight or during his fight there is no uh, a champion in uh, fighting or wrestling ask uh, for a break to have a pee of course so antidiuretic hormone is important and the pleasing during the stress but uh, insulin and testosterone and estrogen are not needed so they are decreased during the stress but other than the increase and the decreased hormones take care the thyroid and luteinizing hormone and the follicular stimulating hormone has nothing to be changed during the stress yes the thyroid the metabolism hormone has nothing to be changed it, there is no change in the thyroid stimulating hormone during the stress isn't it amazing and keep it in mind this is the trick so regarding the sympathetic nervous system take care the sympathetic nervous system it changes in stress there will be a stimulation of the catecholamine release and causing tachycardia and hypertension and by the way there is a very tricky question recall talking about the physiological metabolic change caused by the adrenaline 
what is it? Think of it. I will give you the answer after that. But keep it in mind. The metabolic chain caused by the adrenaline. So regarding the cortisol, it changes during stress. A significant increase within 4 to 6 hours of surgery. More than 1000 nanomole per liter. The usual negative feedback mechanism fails and the concentration of the HTH and the cortisol remain persistently increased within 4 to 6 hours. The magnitude and duration of increase correlate with the severity of the stress and the response is not abolished by the administration of corticosteroid by the way. The metabolic effect of the cortisol are enhanced. Skeletal muscle protein breakdown to provide gluconeogenic precursor and amino acid for protein synthesis in the liver and the stimulation of lipolysis, anti-insulin effect, mineralocorticoid effect as well as the anti-inflammatory effect. It will be the magic during your stress. The growth hormone will be increased by the influence of the pituitary gland where the ACTH and the growth hormone is stimulated by the hypothalamic releasing factor and the corticotrophic releasing factor and somatotrophin growth hormone releasing factor. The preoperative increase of the prolactin secretion occur by releasing of the inhibitor control. The pituitary inhibitor control will be released and all the pituitary hormones will be released. This will cause a growth hormone increase. This is why it increases. Why it increased during our stress? Increased secretion after surgery has a minor role in fact. The most important for preventing the muscle protein breakdown and prompt promote the tissue repair by insulin growth factors. This is the effect of the growth hormone. Antidiuretic hormone during stress. An important vasopressor and enhanced the hemostasis important for vasopressing and enhancing the hemostasis and by the way it prevents you from peeing because it <laughs> it will help you to concentrate in your stress either with fight or flight without a pee and renin is released causing the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and by the way angiotensin 2 formed by the ACE and angiotensin 1 which causes secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex this increased sodium reabsorption and distal convoluted tubule so the effect of the antidiuretic hormone on the sodium reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule and take care angiotensinogen will be angiotensin 1 and the angiotensin 1 would be angiotensinogen by the effect of the ACE. Keep it in mind. This is great surgeon. Take care. When we are talking about a metabolic effect or metabolic changes, we are talking about carbohydrate metabolism, protein metabolism, lipid metabolism, salt and water metabolism, cytokines. This is the word metabolic changes. Keep it in mind. When you answer a question, read, is he asking about the changes caused by Kaza or, uh, for example, whatever, metabolically or in general. If we are talking about metabolic changes, we are talking about carbohydrate metabolism, protein metabolism, lipid metabolism, salt and water metabolism, cytokine changes. This is the metabolic changes. For example, during the stress, the metabolic changes during the stress. During stress, the carbohydrate metabolism will occur. What changes to the carbohydrate metabolism during stress? It will be causing hyperglycemia. Main feature of the metabolic response to surgery or any stress will be hyperglycemia due to the increase in glucose production and reduction in glucose utilization. The catecholamine and cortisol will promote the glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And they will inhibit the insulin. The initial failure of insulin secretion followed by the insulin resistance affects the normal response. The proportion of the hyperglycemic response reflects the severity of the surgery. Take care. Hyperglycemia impairs wound healing and increase infection rate. 
So it's important during stress, but too long stress is not advised. Hyperglycemia is feeding the bacteria. So let's continue the metabolic changes during stress regarding the protein metabolism. The protein metabolism. Initially, there is inhibition of protein anabolism. Anabolism is building. Catabolism is destroying and destruction. So the protein metabolism during stress. Initially, there is inhibition of the anabolism. This means enhancing catabolism. So during surgery or stress, the protein will be catastrophic, will be catabolized, will be destroyed. And the amount of protein degradation is influenced by the type of stress you are facing. Even nutrition status of the patient can enhance the protein anabolism or catabolism. So fasting is some sort of stress. So mainly skeletal muscle protein is the mainly affected. And the amino acid released from the acute phase protein like fibrinogens, reactive protein, complement protein, and the microglobin as well as the amyloid A and seroblasmine and all are used for gluconeogenesis remember we said we said that the carbohydrate chain metabolic changes will be hyperglycemia do you think from where will we get all this glucose we will destroy every protein to form a glucose in a process called gluconeogenesis and we will destroy our stored glucose and do glycogenolysis. The protein metabolism will have a nutritional support has a little effect on the preventing the catabolism during the stress. So, what do you think will happen to the lipid metabolism during stress? During stress, there will be increased in the catecholamine and the cortisol and the glucagon secretion and the insulin deficiency. Insulin will be inhibited. Insulin is not beloved in the stress, in the degrees. So, this would promote the lipolysis and the ketone body production. If we want to talk about the salt and water metabolism during stress, we have ADH will cause water retention, concentration of the urine. We agreed no one want to be during his fight or his flight. During his stress, please don't pee. Concentrate on your stress. And the potassium loss will occur. And may continue for up to 3 to 5 days after this stress. Rain cause sodium and water retention. That's why the nutrition prevents the adverse effect of the stress response. And begin enteral feeding whenever possible to improve the recovery. This is this is the advice you give it to your patient or anyone going through his study. Please keep your favorite drink beside you and a bar of chocolate and anything make you happy physiologically, psychologically and your body fat is important. You have to eat well to can study well. And please push your threshold of stress high beyond your exam. We have a 300 question exam. You are now stressed by answering 10 to 50 questions. This is stressful for you. This is your threshold by now. We are training together to push our threshold and make the 300 question per day or per three hours are our routine. So during the exam, you want to be stressed. So your stress now will be your key during your exam. Be stressed now and be relieved during your exam. No worries. Now, let's be having a glimpse on the intracranial pressure increase. The raise in the, in the intracranial pressure will come to you direct question in the exam. Asking you about it as a question triad or asking you as what sign will be found in the raised intracranial pressure. This is a question triad, widening of the pulse pressure, respiratory changes, as well as bradycardia. Again, wide, wide pulse pressure, respiratory changes, and bradycardia. Very important to keep it in mind. By the way, due to raise in the intracranial pressure, the systemic hypertension is usually seen. 
and completion of the respiratory center will typically result in the kinestoke style respiration. The kinestoke or the shinestoke respiration is an abnormal pattern of breathing characterized by progressively deeper and sometimes faster, followed by gradual decrease that result in a temporary stop in breathing. This is called the apnea. Apnea is a stopping of breathing. This is a kinestoke respiration pattern. Will be progressively deeper, sometimes faster, followed by gradual decrease and may cause temporary stop breathing, which is apnea. The pattern will be repeated with each cycle, usually taking from 30 seconds to 2 minutes. Just like we mentioned the cushion triad of the increased intracranial tension, we have to mention the cardiac tamponade because the heart and the brain are important to some extent, right? The cardiac tamponade called Bex triad. It will be characterized by hypotension and jugular venous distension as well as muffled heart sound. So, don't mix it up with the tension pneumothorax because the tension pneumothorax will have hypotension and jugular venous distension but absent breath sound will be in the tension pneumothorax but in the cardiac tamponade will be muffled heart sound but in the tension pneumothorax will be absent breath sounds breath sounds are absent in the tension pneumothorax because tension pneumothorax hyper resonance of the lung while the Bexa triad we are talking about cardiac tamponading around the heart we are talking about the heart sound so Bex triad, hypotension, jugular venous distension and muffled heart sound by the way cardiac tamponading is not a good thing for the heart the heart doesn't need a cushion from the tamponading to have its effect it has its lung cushion the tamponade is a serious condition where the heart can't bump enough blood to your body due to fluid build up around it, your heart. So cardiac tamponade is a bicardial tamponade where the fluid is collected within the pericardium, the covering sac around the heart. According to the ATLS 10th edition right now we are following, you have to detect the cardiac tamponading as well as the pneumothorax during your C because we are knowing we are following the ABC rule during the ATLS protocol the C where you have your ultrasound fast scan so the fast scan will be at the point C where you have to search for the pneumothorax as well as the cardiac tamponading and if you found the cardiac tamponading with your probe ultrasound fast you have to do pericardiosynthesis, which is a procedure done to remove the fluid around the pericardium, the sac around the heart, to prevent this collection. It's done using a needle and small catheter to drain the excess fluid. Pericardiosynthesis, the subsevoid approach, the most famous one, subsevoid approach will be using a needle inserted between the sevoid process and the lower costal margin with an angle 30 to 45 degree angle the aim for the left mid clavicle and direct the needle towards the anterior wall of the right clavicle be safe and save the patient from the cardiac tamponade and of course you have to detect it with the pexa triad before even doing the pro uh, ultrasound during your fast scan be a great clinician to be a great surgeon now let's move on to some respiratory notes regarding the control of the ventilation controlling of the ventilation is coordinated by the respiratory centers the respiratory centers are the medulla respiratory center the abnostic center and the pneumotactic center Again, we have three main respiratory centers. The control of ventilation is coordinated by respiratory center, chemoreceptor, and the lung receptor and muscles. And we talked about the respiratory centers. The automatic involuntary control of respiration occurs from the medulla. Thank your medulla for your respiration. Of course, thank God who brought up the medulla. But give the credit for the medulla for its involuntary control.
you are not thinking for your next press. The medulla is doing it for you. The respiratory center control the respiratory rate and the depth of the respiration, by the way. And those respiratory center, let's take a brief note about each one of them. We have the medullary respiratory center, the abnusic center, and pneumotaxic center. The medullary respiratory center, where in respiratory and expiratory neurons, has ventral group which control forced voluntary expiration, and dorsal group controls the interrupt inspiration. So, the ventral group for expiration and the dorsal group for inspiration. And in case you have forgot, take a deep breath and inspire. See, you have got your head to the back, to the dorsum. Now exhale. Yes, you came in front. So, expiration with the ventral group and inspiration with the dorsal group. Isn't medicine is easy? This is uh, simply the medullary respiratory center, the medullary. While the abnusic center at the lower points, it stimulates inspiration, activates and prolongs inhalation, and overridden by the pneumotaxic control to end the inspiration. So, abnusic stimulates inspiration. This is the points. And pneumotaxic control the end of this inspiration and override it. So, pneumotaxic center, it's at the lower, at the upper points. So, the lower points in, in stimulate the inspiration. And the upper points has the upper hand and overrides the pneumotaxic control, meshi, and inhibits inspiration at a certain point. We all need oxygen in our blood. But guess what? The control, the main control of your ventilation is via the carbon dioxide. That's why, remember in the EBG, we all talk that the carbon dioxide is the key to understand what is the state of your respiratory buffer system. The level of carbon dioxide is the most important in ventilation control, not the, the oxygen. That's why, if you uh, watch the anesthesiologist during the anesthesia, while waking up the patient, he might force the patient uh, and clench his nose to make the patient ask for oxygen and make the patient retaining carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide will stimulate the respiratory center. That's why the carbon dioxide is more important in ventilation control. So, we have a peripheral chemoreceptor and central chemoreceptor. The peripheral chemoreceptor of respiration located in the bifurcation of the carotid arteries and the arch of the aorta. They respond to changes in the reduced oxygen and increased proton and increased carbon dioxide is the mainstay in the arterial blood. The central chemoreceptor located where? In the medulla. We all thank the medulla because it's responsible for our involuntary respiration and this responds to increase of the proton and increase the brain interstitial flow to increase ventilation but take care the central receptor not influenced by the oxygen level by the carbon dioxide level and lastly we have to mention the lung receptors which include the stretch receptor and the irritant receptor and the juxtra capillary receptor it's other than the juxta glomerular cell, by the way. We have the lung here. It's not the renal. So we are talking about the lung receptor. The stretch receptor responds to the lung stretching, causing a reduced respiratory rate. And the irritant receptor responds to the smoke, causing bronchospasm. From all those voice notes, we hold, uh, all what we need is that carbon dioxide is the more important for ventilation. And the main respiratory center within the medulla. Those are the most important questions from all those voice notes regarding respiratory centers. Dear great sir, let's be back and take a note regarding the calcium mineral. Calcium is mainly absorbed from the small bowel and this will have a direct long-term impact on calcium metabolism and increase the risk of osteoporosis. That's why only extensive a small bowel section will have long-term impact on patients with calcium metabolism problem. But the distal gastrectomy 
cholecystectomy, subtotal colectomy, gastric banding for obesity will have minimal effect on the calcium and can be uh, supplied uh, and can be uh, uh, substituted with oral intake. Remember that 10% of the calcium is absorbed from the colon, while mainly absorption within the small bowel. That's why extensive small bowel section will affect the calcium metabolism. This is called the applied physiology. By the way, the surgeons and the physicians understood all those concepts by trial and error. And that's why we now in the modern ages, we are taking the knowledge without trial and error. No one wants to take the patient and make him uh, a colorectal anastomosis without knowing the effect of this colorectal anastomosis on his long-term life or giving him an extensive bowel, a small bowel resection without knowing that this will cause him a hypocalcemia. Take care. By the way, in the exam, it, this question can be reversed regarding the hypocalcemia clinical consequences. He might ask you which operation can cause hypocalcemia, and of course, it will be a, a question about operation affecting the ileum. We have ileum resection. But it can ask you that after uh, a patient with, uh, for example, Crohn's disease, and you have done multiple resection, and he will tell you that the patient gone for numbness, tingling, and uh, uh, will be irritable, personality changes, seizures, even ECD changes like prolonged Q and T interval. This is hypocalcemia, by the way. He is asking you about the hypocalcemia and asking you to get the patient calcium. Or even ask you about after thyroid resection, the same sequence, okay. This is due to, yes, the parathyroid have been resected within uh, the thyroid gland without caution. Or the blood supply was uh, altered. The blood supply of the parathyroid gland have been altered during the surgery. Take care. All of these questions are about the calcium. Yes, great surgeon. Take care. Regarding the chapter renal. The renal plasma flow is not the glomerular filtrate. The renal plasma flow is measured by the para-amino hyperpuric acid, the PAH. Bah. So the renal plasma flow is the amount of the para-amino uh, hyperic acid over the difference of the para-amino hyperic concentration in the renal artery or vein. So the urine over the artery and vein. A normal value is 660 milli per minute. This is not the measurement of glomerular filtrate rate. It's another thing. So the renal plasma flow is para amino hyperic acid. Why the glomerular filtrate rate can be measured with inulin and creatinine. And we talked and agreed that the inulin is more specific for the glomerular filtrate rate. And the features for the substance used for measurement of the GFR, the glomerular filtrate rate, have to be inert, free filtration from the plasma to the glomerulus and no, not bound to the protein and not absorbed nor secreted at the tubule and the plasma concentration constant during the urine collection. This is great surgeon. Take care from the lung compliance. Think of the lung as a balloon. If it can be inflated easily like the balloon, this is elasticity. This is compliant. But if it's like a tire, it's not very compliant, not very elastic. So the lung compliance is a measure of the ease of the expansion of the lung of the thorax. Determined by the pulmonary volume and its elasticity. Again, think of the lung as a balloon or a tire, a car tire. A high degree of compliance indicates loss of elastic recoil of the lung as in old age or emphysema. This increased lung compliance is due to loss of supportive tissue around the airway, while a normal lung has a high passive elastic recoil. The sick lung has a decreased elasticity, decreased pul transpulmonary pressure, which leads to increased lung compliance. 
decreased compliance means that greater change in pressure is needed for a given change in volume as in atelectasis, pulmonary fibrosis, pneumonia, or even lack of surfactant. This is simply the lung compliance. Anticoagulants, heparin especially, is very important in the vascular surgery and the physiology uh, chapter as well as the preoperative and postoperative. It's very important to understand the anticoagulant. So let's have some notes about heparin. Heparin causes the formation of complexes between the antithrombin and activated thrombin factor 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Advantage of the low molecular weight heparin, it has a better bioavailability and lower risk of bleeding and longer half-life as well as little effect of the PTT as the prophylactic dosage and less risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. The head has less risk of the head, and no one wants a head. That's why we tend to use the low molecular weight heparin. The complications would be bleeding, osteoporosis, and it has less risk for head, but even head can occur. So heparin induced thrombocytopenia can occur. 5 to 14 days after the first exposure, by the way. And of course, like any drug, anaphylaxis can occur. In surgical patients that may need a rapid return to theater, administration of unfractionated heparin is preferred as the low molecular weight heparin have a longer duration of action and are harder to reverse. So, unfractionated heparin is used if the patient might have a soon surgery. Thrombocytopenia Causes of severe thrombocytopenia might be ITB, DIC, TTP, hematological malignancy. And by the way, the ITB can occur all of a sudden. A young girl without any anything, you will find her bleeding from her mouth, from her anus, and having a bruises along her body and will be after long, long investigation will be diagnosed with ITB. So keep it in mind. Causes of moderate thrombocytopenia, the heparin induced thrombocytopenia and drug induced like quinine, diuretics, sulfonamides, aspirin, thiazides, all of those can cause thrombocytopenia and never to forget the heparin. Again, quinine, diuretics, sulfonamides, aspirin, thiazide, and the famous heparin, as well as the alcohol. Never drink alcohol because it can cause thrombocytopenia, as well as the liver disease, hyperspelinase, viral infections like the Epstein Barr virus and HIV, and the pregnancy can cause thrombocytopenia as well. Antiphospholipid syndrome and systemic lupus are very famous autoimmune diseases that can cause thrombocytopenia. And of course, lastly but not least, the vitamin B12. So severe thrombocytopenia kept in mind, the ITB, the IC, TTP, hemato hematological malignancy, and the moderate thrombocytopenia with the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and the drug-induced like quinine, diuretics, sulfonamide, aspirin, thiazide, as well as the alcoholic and liver disease. All of those reasons must be kept in mind, the autoimmune and the and the disease especially. If I want to make you collect some of, the, of those reasons and those causes of thrombocytopenia, keep in mind the ITB, the IC, and uh, heparin, of course, as well as the thiazide and systemic lupus and vitamin B12 deficiency. And by the way, thrombocytopenia is a condition which means low blood platelet count. You have low platelet count in your blood. The platelets, the thrombocytes, that's why thrombocyte, platelets, penia means low. So, platelets are colorless blood cells that help the blood clot, and it's very important. Or otherwise, how would you think that bleeding stop? 
is the thanks for the platelets in our blood. And when we are talking about the idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, the ITP is an immune disorder in which blood doesn't clot normally. This condition is now more commonly referred as immune thrombocytopenia, the ITP, which can cause severe excessive bruising and bleeding and unusual low platelet count. The trick in the exam will ask you which of the following will be least associated with thrombocytopenia and he will mention the heparin of course it can cause thrombocytopenia will cause infection mononucleosis which is caused by the Epstein Barr virus and this cause thrombocytopenia liver diseases okay and the pregnancy of course will cause thrombocytopenia and will put you an autoimmune disease like the rheumatoid arthritis and here is the trick the rheumatoid arthritis doesn't cause thrombocytopenia the lupus erythematosus can cause thrombocytopenia in general, it's associated with thrombocytosis, the rheumatoid arthritis. In some cases, like the Felty syndrome, there will be thrombocytopenia may be seen secondary to hypersplenism. This is, however, represent a very small percent of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So mainly, rheumatoid arthritis will be thrombocytosis, except for a very small portion will be with Felty syndrome. And medicine is incidence. So this is the trick in the exam. Not every autoimmune disease will be causing thrombocytopenia. We are talking about the lupus erythematosus, for example, or even the antiphospholipid syndrome. But the rheumatoid arthritis alone, thrombocytosis. But with felty can cause thrombocytopenia secondary to hyperspirin.